Hi, how are you? Welcome back to Pod Bless Texas. My name is Kendall Scudder here at the Pod Bless Texas World Headquarters in East Dallas. It's good to be back, Pod Bless Texas fam. It's good to be back. We didn't mean to be gone that long. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to explain to you what all happened uh, and what's been going on in the last year and a half that we've been gone. Uh, you know, we recorded this show weekly for four years and um, had a bit of a snafu last year that there are a couple of years, I guess a year and a half ago now that really slowed us down. Um, but I will, I'll keep you up to speed on that. We have a really great guest today that you're going to love. Um, it's a super surprise. And so I'll let you know when I'm done with my splaining. <laughs> Look, um, okay, here's what happened. So our last episode that we did was with Senator Al Franken, right? This was in the fall of 21. And we had talked on the show a lot about the redistricting maps coming down the pipeline. And sure enough, they dropped redistricting maps and put an open Democratic seat in my neighborhood. <laughs> and so I had to take a hiatus and quickly pull a campaign together to run. And spoiler, lost. I guess I'm still a lovable loser. <laughs> I uh, I was beat by by a handful of votes by John Bryant, who is an awesome rep for East Dallas, and we're lucky to have him. Um, and then while I was doing that, Lillian Salerno, our co-host, uh, started applying for positions in the Biden administration. And um, so we had to kind of go radio silent and couldn't really talk much about it. And since then, Lillian has been appointed to the Biden administration. She's the uh, Texas State Director for the United States Department of Agriculture Rural Development. Uh, and I was elected as one of the vice chairs of the Texas Democratic Party at our convention last July. And so it has been a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, Lillian has since gotten engaged and gotten married. I have since gotten engaged. We've got a lot to get caught up on, guys. Uh, but I, I just couldn't really stand for us not to be back. I miss doing this. I missed you guys. I missed interacting with all the people that were in the Pod Bless Texas universe. And it feels like everywhere I go around the state of Texas, um, you know, people were asking, when are you bringing the podcast back? When are you bringing the podcast back? But, you know, the challenge is that Lillian Salerno is a bureaucrat. <laughs> and so I can't bring the podcast back with Lillian. And it felt weird replacing her. And it felt weird doing it without her. But um, I've talked about it with a lot of y'all that I've been talking to around the state as I've been traveling for my state party stuff. And it seems like everybody's cool with me bringing it back for now. Uh, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I'll still bring you some some great guests that will come through and we'll talk about cool stuff that's happening in Texas politics. We'll talk about bad stuff that's happening in Texas politics. We'll talk about worse stuff that's happening <laughs> in Texas politics. Um and I think we're just going to make it a little bit more kind of relaxed interview style. I hope that's cool with y'all. If you got recommendations of things we can do that, you know, makes it easy and, and still kind of operable for me to do, you know, feel free to shoot me an email, info at poblesstexas.com. Let me know. Um, you know, we're just, we're figuring this out as we go. <laughs> You'd think I'd be a pro at this by now, but here we are. <laughs> um but yeah, so so we're back now, and I want to bring in our first guest. Our guests are going to be here for the whole episode now. And so our next guest is a huge get. You're going to be really excited to hear who she is. Uh, I'm about to let her into the meeting now. You may have heard of her. Her name is Lillian Salerno. She is currently this Texas State Director for the United States Department of Agriculture, <laughs> Rural Development. Um, she's been crisscrossing this state, trying to make sure that the Biden administration is serving rural Texans well. I thought she'd be a really great segue as a first guest on this new season of Pod Plus Texas. So let me welcome her now. Lillian Salerno, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. So happy to be here. Wow. It's like I'm talking to royalty, an official appointee in the Biden administration. Aren't uh, you fancy? I'm very, very fancy. Yes. That, <laughs> driving those 10 hour days to get to rural Texas. I'm very, very fancy. Up in your ivory tower in Temple, Texas. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm happy to be here and really, really happy that you have relaunched Pod Bless Texas and think that's really needed in all the 
activities in Texas. We we play such an outsized role in the, not only in this country but of course everywhere. So I would yeah. love to talk to you about all things that I'm allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to try to talk to you about things you may not be allowed to. And if that's yeah. the case, you just push back on me and tell me to to screw off. So. Okay. First of all, where are you? I don't see anything I recognize besides I'm at uh, the Pod Bless. Dirt. I am at the Pod Bless Texas World Headquarters, ma'am. Oh, oh well, I forgot about that. Do you see? It didn't show yeah. up on Google. <laughs> so, so uh, behind me is my original George McGovern, uh, I, I vote Democrat because I work for a living poster. It's really cool. Yes. And then I've got my cool, like, forgive how gross my office is, but I've got my cool little Ann Richards up here. Oh, I love that. Got all <laughs> kinds of fun stuff. So, you know, awesome. we just, for those of you listening and you can't see it, I mean, I guess that's your problem, but there's a picture of Ann Richards and she's smoking. So, yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Well, when I'm not in the, uh, hinterlands around uh, Texas with our biggest rural population in the country, I uh, hail in either at my farm or at my place in Plano, which is where I'm at now. Plano, Collin Plano. County. You've always had loved Collin County. I have loved and hated Collin County for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally making peace with it. Well, let's talk about your rural stuff right quick, okay? So, <laughs> so what is this position? I think a lot of people may not even realize the number of appointees that a president gets, right? So can you kind of explain that sure. process and what you do? I would have never known had I not worked on the Barack Obama campaign back in 2007 seven, that any of these worlds of politics uh, emerge, but there's a whole cadre of people that live to be political appointees. I wasn't one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but um, because I you know, know how to manage things Apparently, uh, I was in the Obama administration, as on a, any of folks that know me know, and then didn't really think about ever going back in. And then um, this, I kept sending uh, candidates to the Biden administration uh, selection team, personnel team of people that I thought it'd be great in Texas to do this job because I knew this job, what it entailed. And uh, for whatever reason, Texas is just so complicated. They couldn't really put very many people who hadn't already had some experience, which left me. <laughs> so finally, I said, <laughs> all right, I, the thought of no one doing it for Texas was really irksome. So I'll do it. And so um, that's how it went. And so just just for, uh, you know, background, any administration gets about 7,000 appointees. And so tons of those are, you know, all your ambassadorships and those kind of fancy pants things. And then they have what they call regional appointees and people like me, Candace Valenzuela is the appointee for um, HUD, like she's the regional appointee. Dr. Uh, Eartha Nance, who's awesome, is the regional appointee for EPA. Uh, the gal from Houston who ran against Chip Roy, I'm, her name always escapes me because I'm such bad at pronounce, pronouncing it, but lovely woman is the regional appointee for for. Um, health, HHS. So those are the kind of regional points. Then you get your, you know, your U.S. attorneys and your all that kind of stuff. So you come in with about 7,000 people and you need all of them and about 150,000 more. And then those sort of lead the administration. So I'm one of those 7,000. I would think it'd take at least 7,500 people to run the country. <laughs> well, there's a lot of federal federal employees. <laughs> so, and that for Texas, so I have, uh, you know, because I was based in D.C. before, I know a lot of people. So I you know, use any of that knowledge to try to get more resources for Texas. So they sort of, lots of the people in the D.C. office are like, oh, what a nightmare, because Lillian knows where all the money's hidden, and she's going to try <laughs> to take it to Texas. And every day, that's what I get up and I try to do. That's awesome. And yeah. so you do that specifically in the realm of rural development, right? right? So rural development is like, a lot of people don't know it exists. And probably, I don't think I did either. Till, uh, <laughs> but it's basically like the World Bank, but for the rural part of this country. So we're the lead federal agency to keep, make sure that rural America thrives, right? And where we are today we're not doing well, right? And so take the politics out of it because I can't really talk about that part, but just talk about like poverty 
you know, health outcomes, all the things that we get measured by, we don't do well in rural in the U.S. and Texas, we don't do well at all. So we're the most, you know, un unintegrated uh, as far as like internet, which means lots of the stuff the Biden administration has done has been very powerful. Texas, ungodly amount of money is coming into Texas to make sure that we have internet, which sort of because of COVID and all was really exposed how sort of messed up we were when we had kids doing their homework and not even at McDonald's parking lots because there's no McDonald's in rural Texas, but in, you know, just people's yards and at, you know, small libraries. And then our health outcomes because we've closed so many rural hospitals. And then what's also been uncovered since, you know, that I didn't know about is just this terrible state of rural mental health. It's uh, substantially higher the rates of you know, all the outcomes that you measure around mental health are substantially higher in rural areas. Not to say, you know, I love cities. I love all the big cities in Texas, as we all do. It's just they have resources that rural people don't have. Do we love all of the big cities in Texas, Lillian? <laughs> well, we know the ones we love. I actually love <laughs> And there's so many big cities. But uh, so one of the things that I think, you know, folks that follow you and sort of our vibe would like is that the rural part of Texas is still such a badass, you know, area because we're like the 3 million people that live in rural Texas make us like the 34th state, right? So like for me, I get on these calls with all people that have my position in these other states and they're like, you know, I need this. I need a new engineer. I need this person. I'm like, you're in Vermont. I drive across Vermont on my way to my office. You know, you don't need anything. I need them all here in Texas. You know, so all these little states I'm always just talking smack about. And they just are like, please, do we have to hear her again? Talk about how many people she has and how many resources. I'm always, my job is to go around and pick up other people's resources and take everybody else's money. <laughs> And I think that's why they put me in it, because uh, Texas historically, under certain administrations, leaves money on the table, like, you know, <laughs> and I just won't put up with that, you know, doesn't mean that, I mean, this is our money, right? This is our tax dollars. So if I don't take it and put it into a small community center in Van Alstine, then, um, you know, Vermont's going to get it from me. Right. And so right. I'm always like, I'm not leaving any money on the table. We can count. On it. <laughs> so I tried to leverage and, you know, try to talk people into. But, you know, we suffer in Texas because of our as much of the country is divided that people are like, you know, I don't want the money, you know, because from Washington, I'm like, we need the money here. Your kids are here. What can we do? And so there's been a lot more collaboration than I thought. You know, after living in D.C. for a long time and coming back and running for office and seeing, you know, watching as we went from the president to the other president and then, you know, electing Joe Biden. I've been really amazed how much good there is also in rural Texas as far as people that certainly don't vote like I do, but that certainly hold my same values. Right. So. We can't talk about the politics of it, but I think what a lot of people would ask about is, you know, sure, you know, taking care of rural Texas is important. Um, but if you talk about who Biden, who put Biden where he's supposed to be, um, maybe all those resources should be going to help some of those folks, right? I mean, that would probably be the argument, right? What is the case, you know, for the Biden administration to invest in rural anywhere, really, when rural politically has been so bad for him and the Democratic Party writ large? Well, yes and no. Uh, I mean, yes, for sure. <laughs> but I mean, from the reason it's placed in the Department of Agriculture is, you know, we really can't feed ourselves if we don't have a thriving rural part of this country, unless we decide. And we may all be in a solely green type of environment where we're drinking out of pouches one day could happen and maybe, <laughs> then, and maybe then we'll write off rural but for right now the congress and the administration are betting on that it's a really good idea to have some natural space in this country to have forests to have rivers to have places where we can grow food where we can you know consume some of our carbon output and that's what i've been completely just overwhelmed by how much the Biden administration, never in a million years from my background, 
even after working for Obama for six years, did I ever think we'd see the kind of money flowing for conservation and climate. This is a really big stuff. And for Texas, for us to like poo poo it and say, yeah, that's invented in Washington. I'm not going to take that money. It's just, you know, we just can't have that. And, and in fact, we're not doing that in Texas. That's where I'm saying that I was surprised it doesn't make the news that much, but there is tons of collaboration. I'm not giving any, you know, shout outs to anyone on either side, but I'm saying adults in the room seem to be recognizing this point in history where this is the most significant climate legislation ever, the inflation reduction. Well, well and I think that that ties in with, you know, another thing that I wanted to ask you about today, and it's just as we all know, and we have talked about regularly on this podcast, I hate talking about the weather, but here we are in sweltering heat in the state of Texas, right? Um, a lot of people attributing that to, um, you know, changes in global temperatures. I imagine that with all of those funds that have come down through ARPA um, to try to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, incorporating some climate work within pandemic recovery. Um, you know, what if that has come to Texas and what are we seeing here kind of as a response to this, you know, hellscape? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of it. I mean, so you had the American Rescue Plan, which is the pandemic money. And then you had the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, which is some of that's climate. But you, the most important piece for as far as climate is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a climate bill, which is basically billions and billions of dollars throughout the country to go to making sure we conserve land, making sure if we if you're willing to conserve land and you're not going to, you know, uh, put cattle on or something that we can we can buy whatever you were going to. Uh, make for those next five years so that we can gain some emission, you know, so the we so because agriculture is such a big part of the climate problem, right? It, it's a huge percentage. I can't remember. I should know that, but it's a huge percentage. And so we're trying to make sure wherever we put money that we receive some results, which means, you know, maybe we're not going to uh, do certain kind of uh techniques in farming that we've been doing and we're going to conserve land. Even on my little farm, I'm no longer having cattle. I'm just putting pollinators because it's the right thing to do for right now. doesn't mean I don't eat beef or anything like that. It's just like right now we all need to put pollinators. We need to do anything we can. I mean, this is, we are in, you know, this is not DEFCON 1. We're in some kind of DEFCON. I can't remember. I think there's five, right? <laughs> Where, I, but think I, there's five. Yeah, I think there's five. I think there's five. But so this Inflation Reduction Act, you know, I was with the Texas Electric Co-ops, which are, you know, a big, powerful group here in Texas, and they, there's 76 of them, and uh, they, they're listening. They're not just saying no, they're not saying yes, give me all your money, federal government, I'm going to get rid of all my carbon uh, footprint. They're not saying that, but they're saying we understand our members are wanting this you know, give us a way to transition, but they're not saying no. When I was in the Barbara, uh, Obama administration, it was just a hard no. It wasn't a, let's discuss. And so that's the part where, you know, I can only speak for Texas and folks here that people seem to be recognizing. I don't want to give them like, they're, they, we're not, neither side's heroes on some of this stuff. But I do think, you know, it's a, there's, there's plans forward that I'm, I'm very, very surprised at how many Texans are willing to say, even hold their nose and say, and I normally wouldn't take federal money or this, but we know this is the right thing to do for my grandchildren, so I'll do it. I'm very uncomfortable, but I'll do it. And that's, again, on broadband, too. Remember, Texas didn't have a broadband office. We didn't have a broadband yeah. office in the state. And now we're getting well over $4 billion. We have six different agencies putting money into Texas on broadband. And, you know, the governor put a broadband office together and everybody's doing everything they can. It's not perfect, none of it, but at least there's money streaming in so that places like where you grew up in East Texas, which is one of the most disconnected places in for for internet, that they're gonna they're gonna work it out. They're gonna you're gonna have high speed internet everywhere in East Texas eventually. Believe it or not. 
<laughs> one day. One day. But we, we <laughs> couldn't even say one day before the pandemic. We couldn't say one day. We couldn't say 30 years from now. We can. There's a track. There's a track forward. Technology is going to probably come in and help us some. But nobody, big companies don't want to go and build out that last mile in a place like Texas because there's no revenue. Of course, the governor, government has to come in. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of things where, you know, you see some bad behavior, obviously. I mean, you see bad behavior on our side too, right? But you see bad behavior, but I do think there's, there seems to be some recognition that we can't count, keep just, you know, just saying no all the time to climate stuff. I think there's a very big recognition and whether that's not started in rural, but they seem to be recognizing that they're part of the solution also. The most That's important part of people in rural, though, for me, just because I'm a people person, are the people. And there's just this great spirit and intellect that comes out of rural that I think defines Texas and people like that grow up in rural and you see them go and they do well. It seems like we don't want to give that up. And so I try to fight hard for sort of the economic development part. So I'm having the time of my life when I'm in that space and I'm talking to city uh, city managers or police chiefs or uh, may, uh, county judges. I'm just like loving all of that part. I don't like the, when I get back to the office, then I got to negotiate with Washington about how to get through the regs to make sure we can get these guys money for the rural hospital or some of that, all that administrative part. But that's what I hated about being a lawyer too. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's more me than the system, but but I do love that part, and I'll, um, I really, really love the people part. Did you, in your new role, do you have to, like, follow the legislature a lot, or do you just strictly stay with national? Yeah, I do a little bit. I'm so dumb on Texas politics now. Like, I, I didn't realize how much I was pretty much just somebody who followed federal legislation until I took this role, and I was like, the only way I really followed Texas legislature is through the podcast right when you and i and that was just us talking how bad everything was. <laughs> I mean, well then but, um, so i you know like you know they've got a you know we handle water all rural water you know we have a huge portfolio for that so you know we've got a constitutional amendment on a billion dollars and for rural water that unfortunately texans don't like to pass constitutional amendments and that's one they should vote for either side would tell you that but that probably I don't know if that'll happen but so I have to follow it at that level but I haven't really I haven't spent as much time when like I was at a event in uh, Beaumont and the speaker was there and you know he doesn't know me and I don't know him other than I know who he is and so you know I'm there with him and we're in a public thing and it's just you know, everybody's excited because we now have a really large uh, long haul driver uh, training center in Beaumont, which is a big deal because they're really short. So it was a very nice event. And, you know, we're all happy as feds that we gave money. And then I forgot about the speaker being there. And that's where it was from. And I'm like, oh, he's here. what am I, an idiot? <laughs> well, then I have some very exciting news for you. Oh, no, you're going to run for speaker. They impeached Kim Paxton. Did you know this? <laughs> I did know that. I did. Okay. Know that. As someone from Collin County, of course I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're right in the thick of Paxton country, aren't you? <laughs> yes. He appears on my ballot frequently. <laughs> well, his, his trial will be happening. Uh, it was supposed to be at the end of August. Looks like it was scheduled for the beginning of September. Um, and, I mean, he's not going quietly into that good night. He's kind of kicking and screaming. Um, thoughts on on the Paxton impeachment? Do you, are you are you allowed to give thoughts on that? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> there seems to be like everywhere I go, people ask like, are, "What do you mean you're impeaching?" I mean, I because it's the you know law enforcement role of the state. <laughs> you're attorney general, and you're impeaching. <laughs> You know, it's like, come on, Texas. Like, you know, when I'm talking to my DC friends or others, they're just like, only in Texas. Like, really? Really? <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's more like that and me going, it's a long story unless you have lived in Texas and have followed the, you know, indictments and politics. But, you know, because I've done democratic politics, of course, we know, you know, his history, but it looks like, you know, it's like, getting your popcorn and watching because it's just going to be, it's almost like a wild west story, really. Yeah. 
Um, I don't have I've any got a, I've got a, on, is it is it good I mean I have no idea if the number of odds makers are saying it's gonna he's gonna go down I can't imagine it happening but I, I can't imagine him being impeached just like intellectually knowing what I know about Texas but I don't know I'm glad we did this trial run on the podcast Lillian, because it's reminding me that in the future I've got to book people who can actually talk about politics <laughs> so <laughs> Well, good. I'll never appear. Again. And maybe I won't have the job when you call next time. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I, I think it's anybody's guess on whether or not this one's going to stick. I mean, it's very obvious that if Republicans are doing the right thing, it'll stick. And they even, I mean, two thirds, three quarters of their caucus voted to impeach him in the House. And yet it's still some liberal witch hunt, which is just beyond me. One but, thing I, I mean, feel- the Texas politics piece that I read of recent, not following, I mean, I read the Texas Tribune. I've been a member since it started. I love the Texas Tribune. They're not one of your competitors today, are they? <laughs> I'm not a journalist, Lillian. I know that might surprise you, but I, I am just a political <laughs> hack. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, so you haven't changed jobs. But I thought the Texas <laughs> piece that uh, interviewed John Bryant was probably the Everything that I know about Texas politics, that's how I felt about it for for a very long time. Since I, I since I worked for when I worked for Bill White in 2010, when I came and tried to help Canada, when I ran myself, when my everything that that said about not wielding power. I when I read it, I was just like, whoever wrote that, I should call that guy. That was for me, that was a snapshot, and that's what it's felt like to me in Texas for a very long time. I'll put that article in the show notes. Um, Yeah, I mean, the article you're referring to is an article by Texas Monthly where Representative John Bryant, the guy who beat me in in the 22 primary. And was my um, congressman when I was a child. Yeah, first elected in 1974, John Bryant. Um, But he, I mean, just, it was a while, we'll talk about I wasn't born yet, I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but he, you know, he he gave an interview to the Texas Monthly where he really skewered establishment Democrats. Frankly, he said what we have been saying on our podcast for a very long time. Um, and I would argue that it is probably the most important interview in Democratic politics in Texas of the decade, at least. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess other people could think I, I just never read was that being so honest about our problem and we can't change the problem without diagnosing the problem. Yeah, I mean, that was just, you know, after John beat me in that primary, you know, I was not happy. <laughs> and and it's I, really bad well, when you know, you I lose. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. And I've done it more than than others. Um, but, you know, I. When I'd gotten into that race, I had no idea that legendary John Bryant was going to be in that race. He filed at like the last minute. And so, you know, when he beat me by, you know, 200 votes or something, I wasn't thrilled. And so I called him and sat down with him. And, you know, we talked it through and pretty quickly found out that we actually were really on the same page about kind of our frustrations with establishment and how to reform it. And since then, we've just become fast friends. I mean, I just love that guy. I'm sure he'll be on the show if uh, if he has time, um, because he's he's got a, a lot of wisdom and a lot of good info to dig out of it, for sure. Well, speaking of establishment Dems, aren't you? I don't mean to be asking the questions, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're part of the Texas Democratic Party, which I've been a long he's- time you know, party person in uh, different pieces of my career, I guess. Uh, but I've always felt like they were out of line with what we needed to do to change the state, but hopefully that's changing. I don't know. <laughs> well, I hear there's great leadership now, Lillian. <laughs> oh yeah. You're one of the leaders. Okay. Then I'm sure. No, it's, it is <laughs> being, being established. It's weird. Somebody said that to me the other day. They were like, aren't you establishment now? And I was like, I mean, I guess it doesn't feel like I am, but I guess I am. You know, I think that we're doing some really good stuff. Obviously, I don't think anybody really wants to get into the weeds of the party, but I think that that things are changing and moving, and and we're we're doing our best to try to build a really strong party. And we just hired a new executive director that I think is going to be gangbusters, and 
have been doing a lot of work to try to, on the topic of rural, been doing a lot of rural work on the party um, that I'm pretty excited about. So yeah, I mean, I think I think things are moving in the right direction. Well, I mean, the, party, the thing fi about rural party finance, we, yeah. we just passed party finance auditing, right? So the party is going to have an internal audit that's going to constantly be operating. I mean, that was, wasn't even thought of five years ago. I mean, so, I mean, I think, I think it's getting there. It's just, it's like trying to make a U-turn on the Titanic, man. It's yeah, hard. It's huge. And I mean, for rural, we have such a, I was actually in rural Texas today outside of Sherman and a pickup truck that drove when I was getting gas, you know, he had on the back of his, you know, F-250 pickup, a, what looked like a farmer dancing on a pole. And it says, I'll dance for diesel. And I just laughed so hard. And of course I had to go talk to him. So and my husband was like, hey, talking to this guy. Tuzzer didn't really understand the reference for the diesel. I mean, he knows what diesel fuel is. He's not an idiot, but and he knows it's expensive. But I just thought it was just brilliant. But his messaging was, I'll dance for diesel. Like, you're killing me. I'm a farmer. You're killing me, the high price of diesel. And for some reason, that, they say that, and the guy I work for, the Secretary of Agriculture, former two-term governor of Iowa, Tom Bill's like, he gets it too. But for us to communicate that and say, we get you, we hear you, great uh, bumper sticker, but they <laughs> vote for but that no matter what we right. say, I can't, I mean, I even told him, I'm like, everybody's trying. He's like, nope. I mean, there's just no way I can I can get to that guy to to make him yeah. consider that we're not the enemy. I'm not I say that I don't mean Democrats. I'm saying the government like for sure we're yeah. the enemy to this dude. And but it was so like he took that in his own hands. He goes, I had it made. And I'm like, what? Like he he I mean, I don't know if he was telling me the truth, but I, I just thought it was brilliant. But I'll dance for okay. diesel. That was awesome. <laughs> well, let's hang on. What Rewind a little bit. For? Let's talk. I've danced for much less. Um, let's rewind a little bit. You said your husband. Um, talk to me a little bit about this, because when we last met, you didn't have a husband, Lillian. I don't believe you were even dating at that point. So um, when did you get married? What happened there, buddy? Oh, um, COVID. Lillian's off the market, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, I had a big long lines before, for sure. Not. <laughs> Uh, so it was COVID and, uh, I, you know, I had you write my wedding, uh, my profile for my, remember your wedding profile. No, it was a Bumble profile. Oh, it was a Bumble I mean, profile. There you, it was a profile. there you go, folks. All you, all you have to do is think about it as a wedding profile, not as a dating Yeah, profile. it was, I was so confident on your writing and how you described me as much more exciting than I am that I'm certain <laughs> that everyone will now subscribe to Pod Bless Texas so they can have their wedding profiles. And anyway, I met uh, Alberto um, in Triago and then started dating. And then we got married in December, in December, uh, 22, So. But you're not doing the whole name change thing, right? You're still Lillian Solaire now? Yes, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, well, should I, should I be changing my name for some reason? I don't know. No, I was just, I knew that that was going to be a question that people want to know the details. <laughs> yeah. well, anyway, he's so lovely and he's uh, uh, born in Mexico City and is the best guy I've ever met. I um, don't get to see you very often, but I did see you in Mexico City for your wedding and it was a riot. <laughs> literally there was a riot <laughs> <laughs> Felt like a riot <laughs> what a great city though right it really is a great city i haven't spent a lot of time there i've only been there twice with you both times <laughs> um but it, it really is a beautiful city it is just gorgeous and guess how many degrees it is right now 68 so when we're looking for uh getting out of the climate wars, it may be one of, something to put on people's lists since it's, uh, I think it's the same elevation as Denver, but I just think somehow uh, this heat thing is going to be guiding a lot of the way we process information here. <laughs> Lillian, it is borderline uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. Like I got out of my truck yesterday. I went to the Texas Democratic Women's 
retreat in Sulphur Springs. It was in my hometown. I was like, oh, that'll be fun. So I went out oh, there. I love and, those gals. How are they doing? Oh, they, they're so great. Remember when we did their convention? We yeah, were the performing the act. Mm -hmm. um, but so when I got back home, it was 109 degrees. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I don't, I don't know that people can are meant to live in 109 degrees. Like it, that is outrageous. Yeah. Is it going to be like this forever? Um, I don't know how we're going to navigate it all. I think it's really one of those things like uh, on a congressional budget, like a line item, like how much the disaster money one puts on it and then how much we've had. Like for USDA, just us, we were the Forest Service is part of us, right? So like we get, we run out of money, but also for just like fires and just here in Texas and, uh, you know, we had fires where we got disaster money where we we're trying to help people rebuild homes and we just knock out that money like very soon so everybody's got to look at the whole idea of what is a disaster so that's something congress is looking at because we don't have near the budget to address these kind of things you know it's yeah right. it, it doesn't look like it's navigable until people look at it a little differently I, I don't think anybody that's in science or in managing scientists at the federal level most of them are thinking we got to start looking at it more like it's imminent and we have to have immediate ways to address it. It's not this, it's just going to be years from now. It's sweltering. It's miserable. And I wish that somebody would have warned us. <laughs> didn't you warn everyone? No, Al Gore did. did. I didn't make that documentary. <laughs> Good grief. He well, did. Lillian Salerno, the Texas state director for the United States Department of Agriculture Rural Development. I am just so thrilled that you took time out to come and join us here on Pod Bless Texas today. Well, thank you for having me. I'll come back when I uh, have accomplished my mission, which is to take all the my fellow states' money and put it here in Texas, and I'll let you know the scorecard at the end of the fiscal <laughs> You heard that, viewers. If you're if you're looking for money, call Lillian Solaire. No, no, no. You have to be in a town of under twenty thousand people. There's all these all these caveats. I wish I had boy, if the federal government would give me a big checkbook, I would just have so much fun in rural Texas. But uh, there's a lot of stipulations, let's just say. But thanks for having me on, and I'm so glad that you're starting this back up. I don't feel like. I mean, I'm jealous because we had a lot of fun doing it and just love the 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 people that follow us are already my favorite people. Not just they're not saying they like us, but I just love people that would even listen. So for me, it's a great thing. Uh, so and if it helps at all with uh, disseminating information that's not, you know, cultivated by uh, people that, you know, think the, the earth is uh, is flat <laughs> and I'm all for that. <laughs> Well, it's going to be weird doing it without you. And like, I'm, my vibe's already a little different. I'm trying to, trying to figure out how to like, you know, kind of get through that and keep that magic. It's not going to be the same without you, Lil. It's just not, but we're going to try. You could have a blow up of me there. Lil, like a I am not going to, I am not going to be purchasing a Lillian Salerno blow-up doll, if that's what or you're this, uh, They did one of my Nisa, not a blow-up doll, Lizzie of a... <laughs> oh, good grief, Lillian. No, I meant like a, a you know, a cutout <laughs> board. I meant the cutout board. I've said blow-up. I meant the cutout board. <laughs> Maybe you should take this part out. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> State director gets fired for mentioning blow-up. This that we're going to miss. <laughs> a card, so, so... So your suggestion is a cardboard cutout of you that I should just like move out and put a second chair in and just have you sitting there? I think that'd be fun. <laughs> if I, or you, it doesn't well, have to be me. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to do an obsessed segment or something, but I don't think I told you to prep for that. And I don't know that I'm prepped for that. Should we keep the obsessed segment or should I not? What do you think? Oh, you definitely should keep it. People love that. Okay, well then... Let's do everybody's favorite segment. It's called Obsessed. Obsessed. Where everybody will talk about one new story for the week, whether it's politics or nothing, they've been completely obsessed with. And as always, we have to start this segment with Lillian Salerno. Lillian Salerno, what is something this week you've been completely obsessed with? Oh, just today I was obsessed. I've been obsessed with um, all those little ducks that they threw into the Chicago River during Chicago has a big, uh, I don't know if it's a 
the uh, festival or something and they put all those little ducks in 500,000 little uh -huh. like rubber ducks and they put in the Chicago okay. River and everyone's excited about it and I all I could think about was who's the sanitation workers who have to go pull them all out and how terrible that would be <laughs> I don't know why I'm not joyful about it but I've been thinking about I guess because I deal with water all the time and it's so hard to find people that work in rural water systems. And I'm thinking, I know it's a great idea. I love how the look, and I love yellow, my favorite color really. And, but I just don't get the <laughs> downside of that, the poor workers who have to go and clean up everybody's mess. So that's what I've been obsessed yeah. with. Yeah, I mean, it, every time I see something like that happen, it does make me wonder like, like whether it's like giant balloon releases or whatever, it's like, what if we just didn't do that, somebody wouldn't have to clean it up. So can we just not? Yeah, but I, sorry, but I feel like that way about cooking right now. So I mean, there's no, no action going on in my kitchen. Like somebody's got to clean up and that's not going to be me. Therefore, the frozen pizza slices over there. No, my husband's a great <laughs> cook. So he cooks, but he also cleans. So <laughs> thank that's God. so funny. <laughs> well, my, my obsessed this week, my obsessed this week does have a Texas tie-in. Um, for those who know me outside of this podcast, I don't ever talk about it on the podcast, but I have a just life obsession with the show 90 Day Fiance. I love 90 Day Fiance, okay? I've watched every episode of every show on 90 Day Fiance. It is a huge time suck. It is not something I need to be allocating my time to, but I have been watching it since it first came out in like 2014 or somewhere around there. All like 15 spinoffs of it. And um, this new season that just came out has a woman in it from Irving, Texas. And she is ridiculous. <laughs> I can't stop thinking about it. So the premise of- Ridiculous in like big personality or what? That she so... represent Texas well. I wouldn't say that, Lil. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, no. Her mother- is the mayor of a town of a suburb outside of San Antonio. And she lives, I know, poor lady, um, because her daughter is just kind of bonkers. The premise of Night Day Fiance is that a person, um, you know, is coming here on a K-1 visa to get married. Uh, you know, they're a citizen of another country and they have 90 days to either get married or they have to leave the country or, or they're here illegally, right? And so you have to quickly get married um, and, and and then they have all these spinoffs that are like the other way where you go and move there. And then before the 90 Day Fiance where they follow you before that. And like there's a whole bunch of them. She's on one called The Other Way. Her name's Statler. And she's visiting some chick in uh, the UK. She packed up all of her things and she noted that her lease expires in a month and she's just going to plan on moving in with this lady without even asking her about it. Hasn't mentioned it to her, hasn't said a word and shows up at her house and is like, mm, it's a little small here. Yeah, because people weren't planning on you moving in, Statler. What? Anyways, it's a great show, but I've just been kind of obsessed with just the the absurdity of it this week because it just always seems to get a little bit further crazy, a little bit further crazy. Literally, a lady's mom died in the last episode. On the set or like? Yes, while they were recording mm. at her house in the Philippines. Like, it feels like the show is always trying to get crazier and crazier to a point where it's like really kind of hard to watch right now. Kind of hard to watch, but I'm still loving every second of it. And I love whenever I find Texans on there, some especially people, ones with political tie-ins. Like people Stabler that love that me. show, love it. You tried to get me to watch it that one time and I just I just didn't buy in, but I appreciate people's love for anything. So that's, uh, <laughs> you do love it. I didn't, I didn't just try to get you to watch it. I tried to get you to go on it. <laughs> <laughs> God, I would never do anything like that. About <laughs> it's like running for office but worse. <laughs> right. Anyways, that's what I've just, Night Day Fiance's new season that's come out and their Texas tie-in is what I've been completely obsessed with this week. And that was obsessed. Great. Well, Lillian Salerno, again, great to have you here. You too. Great seeing you. And thank you thank for you having so me if on. People wanted to, if people wanted to follow you or the work nope. that the 
the United yeah. States Department of Agriculture, Rural <laughs> Development, and State of Texas is nope. doing, where could they go to do that? Nope. Again, I'm again, not doing social media. <laughs> I've just had a really good last four or five years without social media, and I'm going to continue that. But you can follow uh, USDA.gov. <laughs> and uh, okay. when, I'm, when I'm not with the administration, I may consider doing social media again. But by that time, maybe it won't be an X. Maybe it'll be a one. Maybe it'll be a two. I don't know what format it'll come. I still, I still do have a oh. Twitter account, but I don't get on it. I just follow people. That man ruined Twitter. He just ruined it. He just said, I can give you $45 billion and burn this to the ground. No, he couldn't have got given pod bless just like a million dollars. I just want one of the million, just one of the million. He might be willing to now since he's just literally burning down the other place. <laughs> I don't think I'm queuing on enough for that guy. Yeah, something. Well, thanks well, for having me well, on. Happy to be on. And if folks wanted to follow the podcast or or whatever fun antics we're going to get into for the next uh, however long y'all let me keep doing this, uh, you can go to all of the social medias at Pod Bless Texas. Um, and we'd love to have you there. You can follow me at Kindle Scudder. So thanks for coming, Lil. And I'm going to miss you. And if you ever want to pop in and do this, or if you quit or get fired or something, you're always welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for knowing I got a seat over there. <laughs> <laughs> you always have a very lucrative volunteer seat next to me, Lillian. <laughs> well. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks for joining, Lil. Bye. Bye.